Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the third in the Grace Center series on uh, what we're calling the Administrative State in Transition, a series of discussions on the policy agendas that we might see in the months and years ahead in the Biden administration and in the new Congress. I'm Adam White, the director of the Grace Center, and as always, it's my, my pleasure to welcome you here today for a discussion of tech policy. Now, obviously, that's an extremely broad category, maybe too broad to cover in just 90 minutes, but hopefully in, in, the, in the next 90 minutes, you'll get a good overview of just the wide diversity of issues that might arise in the administration and in Congress from, from three experts from varying walks of life. I'll introduce them each one by one as it's their turn to speak. Um, and we'll begin with Alex Stapp. Alec is, um, I just, uh, Alec, I just misplaced my, uh, my introduction for you. Oh, Alec is Director of Technology Policy at the Progressive Policy Institute. His work has been cited widely by the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, and other major publications. He has a master's in economics from here at George Mason University. Alec, sorry for momentarily forgetting. <laughs> All good. Uh, well, welcome, and please, what should we be looking for in the, in the months and, and year ahead? Yeah, uh, Adam, thank you, and to the uh, Boyd and Gray Center for having me today. It's an honor to be here with my fellow panelists as well. And so I'll kind of kick us off by talking about what we, what I think will happen in a Biden administration on tech policy and what I think should happen, what I wish they would uh, spend more time on. So I'll start with what I think they will prioritize um, given tech policy. So I'll start off by saying, why I don't think tech policy issues will be an overall priority for the Biden administration. They've made it very clear that their number one priority is the COVID response. So first getting the virus under control, prioritizing vaccine distribution, um, and just putting an end to the pandemic once and for all. And then after that, they're prioritizing uh, the economic recovery. And a, a key part of that will be the infrastructure bill. So that'll be the next large legislative package to go through Congress um, once the first $1.9 trillion bill is done. And so I don't think, I mean, we, we're here to talk today about tech policy, but you have to think about the finite resources that Congress has in terms of time and attention um, to the wide array of issues. And then you have to think about how tech policy might fit in that. Um, so I think one, tech policy issues will be further down the ladder, uh, whether we like that or don't like that. Um, and then in that bucket of tech policy issues, they're likely going to prioritize antitrust um, issues. And that's for a couple of reasons. One, because antitrust is the big stick. It's the scariest thing. It's, it's, it shows that you're doing something on tech policy. And you do that either legislatively or through the enforcement agencies at DOJ and the FTC. So I think um, there might be some movement on the Klobuchar bill. Senator Klobuchar announced uh, legislation last week that would lower the bar for enforcement decisions. So it would change some merger presumptions to where merging parties, especially at large companies, would have to show that uh, that merger would increase competition rather than having the burden be on the government to show that it would decrease competition um, and, and include a lot of things like more resources for the FTC and DOJ, which my organization has endorsed, um, as well as some retrospective studies on, you know, have mergers been anti competitive in the past? And um, what's the state of competition? So more hearings, more investigations, that sort of thing. We think that's, that's necessary in sectors all across the economy. But for any given reason, you know, the default assumption in DC is that legislation will not get passed. I think it's a low likelihood, but it will be a priority. More likely is that the DOJ will continue the Google case that the Trump administration started. And the FTC will continue the Facebook case that was also started right before the end of the Trump administration. And we could see more enforcement actions. And again, it's because their enforcers have a lot of discretion. And so under current laws, they believe there are cases out there that they can win. We can disagree about the likelihood of those sort of things, but um, those are much easier to do and much can be much quicker. And so that can kind of um, state people's desire to see action there. So that's kind of what I think will happen. Um, uh, what I think should happen is, is a different set of lists of priorities. I think those, those antitrust cases are relatively weak. We get into the merits. So it's things like data privacy regulation. Um, some viewers might have heard of the SHRIMS 2 decision out of Europe. Um, this basically invalidated EU US privacy shield, which is actually a huge deal that most, most people will never have heard of, never care about. Um, but that actually allows transatlantic data flows. So US company, tech companies operating in Europe and European tech companies operating, operating in the US, there are many fewer of those. Um, but the key is that now you, it's, it's much harder to bring data across the ocean. So they invalidated the safe harbor provision that the two governments had negotiated. And now companies are relying on what are known as standard contract clauses, which is like the belt and suspenders approach to this. But any day now, a data pri privacy regulator in the EU will invalidate that approach. And then we're going to be up a creek where companies can't bring data across the ocean anymore. So it's a huge risk out there that's going to lead to all sorts of ramifications. 
And one way we could potentially alleviate some of the EU's concerns are by passing federal privacy legislation in the United States. Um, and the other incentive to pass data privacy legislation is that we're seeing more state level privacy bills. And as we see those proliferate, we're gonna have more conflicts between them, compliance costs go up for companies trying to um, operate across state lines. Um, so that's another incentive for federal um, policymakers to come in and say, hey, let's preempt the states. Um, let's get one national standard for federal privacy legislation. Let's try to avoid some of the errors of GDPR in the EU and the California privacy law that was just updated last cycle as well. And so that's a huge issue that I think really should be top of mind. And, and I'm, I'm not as optimistic that it'll be moving on that as I am on antitrust uh, stuff, but that's a big area. And then I won't go into details on others, but just a couple of topics maybe we can discuss further um, among each other. I think gig worker benefits should be a huge issue that we need to talk about more about. Um, as well as how we can counter China internationally. So how do, we, how do we bring our allies to the table to set the rules of the road internationally on tech issues in a way that isolates China, puts pressure on them um, to set in some of their worst practices? Because I worry that if the EU and the US become confrontational with each other, that lets China kind of um, run wild in the rest of the world and set the rules for everybody else. And so that's a, that's a concern I'm watching as well. Thanks, Alec. I just I gather then from the way you sort of frame things that of, of the other issues that you think should be a priority, data privacy is definitely number one. Yeah, I think it's definitely number one, just because I think, uh, you know, te technology is about globalization. Uh, the One of the best parts of um, technology policy in the United States is that I don't want us to be too negative on it as we're framing these issues. Like there are problems, and there are social costs that need to be mitigated or reduced. Um, but at a very high level, we shouldn't be too negative on our own policies over the last 20 to 30 years in the United States. Um, a, a key statistic that kind of still just blows my mind is that of the top 30 internet companies ever, and it's according to Mary Meeker, who's a venture capitalist, famous venture capitalist um, in Silicon Valley, uh, they, those top 30 companies have created more than $6 trillion in market capitalization, and 18 of them have been US-based. So we have more than half of all the largest internet companies ever started in the United States. And that's not even just beginning to talk about the consumer benefits of these platforms. They're global platforms, often free to use. Um, they're a, a version of soft power of projecting liberal values worldwide, free speech um, foremost among them. And so number one, it was any kind of policy in a Biden administration and a democratic Congress. I want us to first recognize all the benefits of previous policies. And then how can we surgically and smartly uh, address targeted harms in a very tangible way. And that's how I'd want us to approach those issues. Great. Thanks, Alec. Our next speaker today is Luli Sani. She is the Policy and Strategic Communications Advisor for the Day One Project, which is an organization focused on democratizing policy in science and technology. Before joining Day One, she was Deputy Press Secretary to U.S. Senator Tim Kaine. And before that, while in college, she was an intern in the White House's Office of Science and Technology Policy. Luli, thanks for joining us today. Um, thanks for having me. And it's uh, good to be here with um, Alec, Ted, and yourself as well. And thanks to um, Jeff for his work in organizing this panel. Um, yeah, I, as um, Adam just mentioned, I am working for the Day One Project. It's a nonpartisan initiative based out of the Federation of American Scientists, um, working to think about um, new and innovative ideas across science and tech pretty broadly. Um, I want to echo a lot of what Alex said. I think, you know, there are, there's obviously a clear focus right now for the Biden administration to tackle COVID and economic recovery first and foremost. And I think, you know, that's where the country's at. That's what's important. But I also think the COVID pandemic has sort of heightened an urgency to deal with some of the tech policy concerns. Um, you know, with more of life in all forms online from telehealth to education to um, socializing and shopping. I think there's more of an understanding from just American people across the country of how tech affects them and more concerns about what anti-competitive practices might actually mean for their da daily lives. I think a lot of these issues that have previously been so niche um, have a real opportunity of being addressed in this administration. Um, and just to sort of like think about the context a little bit, I mean, you know, the Trump administration sort of touched on beginning to think about some of these issues more critically, as Alec mentioned with the DOJ antitrust case and some, you know, some thinking from Trump on, uh, you know, 
concerns about strategic um, competition with China. But before that, the Obama administration also got started on some of these issues, but really never moved much farther. Um, and I think we have reached a point in 2021 that it's no, we're no longer able to sort of push these issues aside. And I think because of the interest from, you know, people across the country in every state on these issues, there is more political will to act. Um, and just to sort of step back a little bit, sharing a little bit about my background, I started working for Tim Kaine in 2017 at the start of the Biden, at the start of the Trump administration. And, you know, Kaine had just come off the uh, presidential election and I was working in comms. And one of the things we were thinking about on a daily basis was sort of the changing media ecosystem. And what we were thinking about disinformation and misinformation and how we can best communicate with constituents. Um, and I think over the past four years, we have seen misinformation continue. There has been no real solution from either the federal gov government or companies like Facebook to tackle this. Um, there was you know, the Facebook oversight board. I think we have seen little progress from them in actually tackling this issue. There have been minor changes from companies to um, you know, take some initial steps to moderating content, but there, there's just so much left to do. And I, I think that from what we have seen from the Biden administration, there is an interest in addressing the disinformation problem. You know, but Biden during his um, inauguration speech, he brought it up. He said, uh, we must reject a culture in which facts themselves are manipulated and even manufactured. Um, and over the past year, we've seen disinformation be, um, you know, affect sort of COVID response, um, contribute to a false, you know, election fraud narrative. Um, arguably contribute to the capital attacks. And I, I think for those reasons, the Biden administration is likely to, you know, prioritize this issue. I, I, I think recognizing that still immediate COVID and economic recovery will come first, but I, I think there is an interest to tackle this um, headfirst. And you can sort of see that in some initial steps the Biden administration has taken. Um, to put domestic extremism on the agenda day one, you know, uh, put someone in the NSC focused on tackling domestic extremism, um, highlighting the urgency and importance in addressing it. And I think part of that is thinking about disinformation as a national security matter. Um, and so, you know, we've seen various experts suggest different things, cross-agency task forces to tackle disinformation. It's not just um, it's not just on one topic or another, um, but I, I think we will see progress in sort of coming to some sort of consensus to think about the disinformation problem more con concretely. And then just one sort of more comment, following up on a couple of the things Alec mentioned, I think, you know, some of the men uh, topics he mentioned, including the gig economy, I mean, I and sort of scrutiny of China's ability to threaten American data security. I think these are issues that people across the country are beginning to understand. They are no longer, you know, they are no longer issues for just tech experts. It is every single person is being impacted by these um, concerns. And I, I think for those reasons, we are likely to see some change. Um, I think tech, and I am sure Ted, you know, with his several decades of experience more than me can speak to this, but I think, you know, on data privacy, companies like Facebook, they don't want to, um, they don't want to follow 50 privacy laws in 50 different states. Some baseline privacy law would actually put everyone on the same page and could be effective. I think whether or not the Biden administration prioritizes this in the first two years or in the next two uh, or in the two years that follow, I think I think it will be on the agenda. Um, and similarly for the gig economy, Section 230, um, and these other issues, I, I think because of sort of the fact that constituents across the country are speaking out and having concerns, labor unions are concerned about gig workers. Um, I, I think we will see action on a lot of these um, issues.
Thanks, Lily. Um, just one question. Uh, you're at the day one project. We're now at about, I, I haven't kept track, we're now about day 20 or so. I saw President Biden signed at least one executive order on the role of science in, in, in policy decision making. I'm just curious if you have any reactions to, to that so far or, or maybe any sort of suggestion on what you hope the next sort of White House, the, the, the next White House initiative out of the gate might be? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, at, uh, Eric Lander, who is leading OSTP um, in this administration, is actually on our leadership council. So we were excited to see him um, announced. I think um, excited to see. I, I think the Biden administration take uh, like take science very seriously and put it first, and um, you know, elevate the role of um, Dr. Fauci and others in decision making across the government. Um, I don't. I don't think I have a specific comment. I, I think I would need to think more about what they should do immediately next. But I, I am pleased to see um, sort of the commitment on these issues. Um, so far. And yes, we have sort of received uh, questions about our name at this point. I think, you know, there was some thinking that our project might actually fold with the start of the new administration, but we have seen so much interest um, in the work and interest from our funders to continue funding us to do the work. So uh, we will we will continue kicking um, for now, um, as long as people are still funding the effort. So um, I think the name will stick. It is it is um, more a symbolic name at this point. I think the, the key to Amazon's success was always Jeff Bezos saying that you'd have a day one mentality every day. And so uh, it'll, it'll work for you as well. Before I introduce our third speaker, I just want to remind our audience, if you do have any questions you'd like to pose to the speakers, and we'll get to those in just a little bit, um, use the Q&A feature in, in Zoom. Just type in your question, and I'll be uh, reading as many questions as we can get to. Uh, our third speaker is Ted Ulyat. Ted is an adjunct professor here at the Scalia Law School, uh, but before that he did a few things. He was general counsel at Facebook from 2008 to 2013. He was a partner at the uh, famed Andreessen Horowitz Venture Capital Fund. Before that he served in government both in the, the George W. Bush White House and in the Justice Department. He clerked for Justice Scalia. Ted, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Adam, and uh, thanks to you and to the uh, Boyd and Gray Center for putting on this event and also for including me in it. And it's great to be here with Luli and Alec. Um, look forward to our discussion. Um, at the start of this, you know, even though we're here to talk about uh, the Biden administration tech policy, I always I like to give this kind of step back thinking about the effect of administration changes on tech policy, which is to say that for tech policy, like for many other areas, a change in the White House and a change in the control of the executive branch does not necessarily mean massive directional changes. Uh, for one, um, if you think about it, many tech, many so-called tech policy issues, and you know, agree with Alec that, and you, Adam, that that's a broad category, an ill-defined category. But for many tech policy issues, are influenced as much or more by local law, state law foreign law and or international bodies, you know, Alec talked at the outset about EU, uh, EU privacy regs, and that's a great example of this, or, you know, think Airbnb and gig economy and the, and the importance of state and local laws for that. And here, here in California, we just had a pro ballot proposition, uh, you know, on, on gig economy issues last November, um, and it had legislative action in the state before that. Um, but so, the when you have issues that are so influenced by state, local, international, foreign rules and bodies, um, the operation of the federal, uh, you know, the federal executive branch is perhaps more limited. I'd also say that a lot of te so-called tech policies just defy party labels, so you don't see as much, uh, you know, as much change as you might expect when there's a change in administration. For example. Um, you know, I think there's two categories here. Some are kind of apolitical. You know, if you think drone policy, right, or autonomous vehicle policy, I mean, maybe at the margin there's some there's some partisan feel there, but I think generally not. Those don't really get the partisan fires going, and those aren't those aren't big places where the parties differentiate themselves. I think generally speaking, within broad strokes, 
on those kinds of issues, you know, I think both parties and the Biden administration, no less than the Trump administration, want to see innovation that keeps America at the forefront, but want to see a reasonable amount of consumer safety on those, right? And um, so I think you're not going to see big swings in issues like that. And so those are ones that that don't gen that are, not, are kind of apolitical. There's also a bunch of issues that are you know that defy party labels. Or you get unexpected bedfellows. I put encryption as one of those, right? Where you traditionally have had you know two of the strong advocates in the Senate, for example, on encryption, have been you know, Senator Feinstein and Senator Burr. And on the other side, you've, uh, you know, you know they've been you know pro backdoor, and and on the other side, pro encryption have been. You know, by uh, uh, Ron Wyden and Rand Paul as some of the leaders there. So you have some that are, you know, just a little unpredictable. And so, you know, who you know who knows where you know who knows where a Biden administration might be on those versus a Trump administration. They might be you know, in a very similar place. Um, so for those kinds of issues that are nonpartisan or bipartisan in nature, the question of which party occupies the White House um, is not really determinative. Um, I would also add on this front that. You know, the Biden administration has a lot of already, even as some of its initial appointees and, and you know, high ranking officials, a number of people from the tech, tech community and or people who have spent time in the tech community. Obviously, Ron Klain comes to mind. You know, Ron is you know, a guy, a very, very good friend. You know, we used to do work together back in the day on a number of tech issues you know, way back in the, uh, I guess, early 2000s, some of the AOL issues. Back then, when that when AOL was still around, but Iran has a deep history in in tech, and obviously has spent so much time at Revolution with Steve Case over the over the years. So he's very attuned to these issues and has a pro tech mindset. Um, you know, I put Jeff Zients in that category as well. You know, former Facebook board member. Um, so you have you know, the, and that's just two examples. But you have plenty of people in the administration who have some ties to tech, who are sympathetic to the tech sector, and who will you know be maybe less have a less pro-regulatory bent than one might expect off the bat from a democratic administration versus a republican administration um i would say on on legislation you know the fact that congress remain further to this point you know, the fact that congress remains closely divided and the legislative filibuster is intact at least for now the likelihood of reaching agreement on really significant legislation seems low to me. I mean, I think this echoes Alex's point. Um, you know, I, you know, we can talk about this later, but um, you know, big privacy legislation seems unlikely. And 230, you know, Section 230 reform, maybe there seemed to be a lot of momentum for that a few months ago, maybe less so now. And and with Congress so closely divided, um, the, it seems that legislative action is not likely. Um, so I guess in conclusion on this thing, the, the, you know, this is obviously not to say that the change of administration will not matter for tech policy issues, but very specifically, I think it'll matter most and the Biden administration will be able to put its stamp most firmly on issues that are A, primarily federal rather than state, local or international, B, are controversial and where there's going to be a significant swing, i.e. not drone policy, and C, that can be carried out by agency action rather than dependent on, on, on legislation. Um, and so what are some examples of that? You know, I'd, I'd echo Alec with, uh, with antitrust to, to begin. And specifically, you know, I think the key there, you know, look, there may be legislative changes to the legislative, you know, legislative changes to the antitrust framework of the United States. But as as you know, as Alec points out, you've got two really big cases pending right now. You've got FTC versus Facebook. You've got DOJ versus Google, and so to me, this echoes the you know, the question is, what is the Biden administration going to do with those two cases that are squarely within its control? Obviously, the you know the DOJ case is absolutely squarely in its control over a DOJ, and we'll see what AG Garland has to has to has to say about that. FTC, you know, an independent agency, but it's going to be three two, you know, continuing on that that case. Um, but how aggressively does the Biden administration pursue these cases? It takes me back to 2000 and 2001 when it, with the Microsoft case, right? Which that which you know the Google case is a very close image of, but 
at that point we had, you know, you had Judge Jackson's ruling against Microsoft, which was at that point on appeal, right, when you had the change of administration. So you have, you know, you have a big win for the Justice Department against Microsoft back then in a case brought by the Clinton Justice Department, then it's on appeal. And then you get a change of administration and probably just in broad strokes, you know, the, a Bush Justice Department, a Bush 43 Justice Department, less enthused about that view of antitrust law. So of course the case settles while on, it settles after, you know, after the appeal and before it gets going, you don't have a breakup of Microsoft and you don't have DOJ pursuing that back in the district court in front of you know, the reassigned judge. So is there gonna be something like that? Will there be for whatever combination of reasons uh, by an acceleration of those cases or a stepping back from those cases? Um, do the companies see this opportunity as a time to come in and say, look, let, you know, let's work on these cases. Let's get some consent decree that works for everybody. Um, cutting against that and, and limiting, I think the Biden administration's control over those two cases is how many state AGs have joined in those cases, right? I mean, you've got, by my latest count, I think it's 14 on the DOJ action, um, including California and Texas, right? So it's bipartisan. And I think it's 47 cases signed up on the, uh, or sorry, that's on the Google case, that's DOJ Google. And then you got 47, case, 47 states in on the Facebook case with FTC. So even if Biden takes a step back, you can have a bunch of state AGs of either party that might move forward with those cases. I mean, I think those are, well, and we can talk some more about those cases, but those are significant ones. In Facebook, you're talking about undoing some transactions, you know, undoing WhatsApp, undoing Instagram, um, and then Google, you're talking about a, a broader and you know, a, a less defined set of requested remedies, but um, you know, potentially far sweeping ones that could dramatically alter the landscape of the tech sector today and going forward. Just to quickly tick off a couple others, um, gig economy, we've talked about that a little bit, both Luli and Alec have mentioned that, but gig economy right now is live, you know, from my perspective, you know, that's one that, you know, as I mentioned, has a heavy state and local component, really a heavy state component to that. But DOL, the Labor Department, of course, has a lot to say about that. And, you know, as, as probably the participants in this call, you know, the participants certainly know, and as the audience is quite familiar, this has been a football at, at, at the Labor Department since at least about 2015, right? You had the, you had the interpretive guidance letter issued by, you know, by, you know, um, it, under, under Sec then Secretary Perez, right? Which broadly speaking in 2015 said, you know, Labor Department is more likely going to interpret gig economy workers to be employees rather than independent contractors then that guidance right letter guidance it wasn't a, it was not a rulemaking that was rescinded by secretary acosta in you know around 2017 so then you get to you know you get to at a state where um at least in the guidance from labor back then it's more likely to go the other way you're more likely going to have independent than treated as independent contractors at the federal level significant change and then of course in the waning days of the trump administration Right, uh, Secretary Scalia issues, I think back in January, you know, a, an actual final rule after notice and comment process, right, with this 29 CFR 780, et cetera. But, you know, which again, broadly speaking, puts DOL under the, you know, under the Fair Labor Standards Act as saying, mo you know, we believe, you know, here's the, here's the new test. And, by the, and that test then ends up treating most gig economy workers. Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, et cetera, as independent contractors, not employees. And as, as this, those dialing in are quite aware, I'm sure, of course, that rule as is customary was suspended. It was supposed to take effect in March. You know, final rule as of January takes effect in March. As is customary, the, the Biden administration suspends all those rules. So I think that's kicked out till May now. And what does you know? You know what does Secretary Walsh do when he comes in there, right? I, you know, presumably, it's you know, it's it's going to be very interesting. It's a live question. I think as a policy matter, you're going to get the Labor Department going back to trying to go back to the 2015 interpretation to say gig economy workers on the whole are going to be much more likely to be you know to be to be employees rather than contractors, uh, but. Um, that's a little harder now. You've got a final rule. Sure, it's not yet taken effect, but it's been after notice and comment. 
So you can't just snap your fingers and withdraw the letter, right? I mean, that's going to be challenged, and you know the you know the the rule did not take effect, but it's, it's in this you know somewhat limbo area. And better administrative law, you know, lawyers than me can tell me what the effect can tell us what the effect of that is. But at least it's going to be harder for the Biden administration to undo that, um, and to go back to that policy. But that's a live, live, live issue right now where you'll see a real impact on the change of administration, from the change of administration. Um, I'll stop there since these are just earlier comments, but some other issues just to flag them in case anybody wants to go back to them. Um, you know, a, I think in FinTech, right, we'll see obviously a reinvigorated CFPB that was in the, in the Obama administration was quite active in looking at new FinTech companies, new FinTech products, Obviously, CFPB has taken a back step under, or it's been more, you know, let's say, deregulatory, less active under the Trump administration. Now you can assume it's going to resume that. So fintech companies, I would say, you know, be ready for some inquiries from CFPB and some, some cases coming your way. Um, encryption, I think, is an interesting area to talk about. Um, and, um, you yeah, know, I'll leave it at that for now. Uh, Section 230, I assume we'll talk about in the Q&A, but a number of areas like that where there can, you know, Section 230 obviously would take legislative action, but I think we can, you know, think about how the Biden administration might want to influence that. But in some, you know, it's these areas where executive action is, and Biden's shown a great willingness to engage in, in, in executive action uh, in his first 20 days. Um, so I think there's ample opportunity, but it's not going to be limitless. And it's going to be, you know, the main place you'll see it are on those issues that are controversial in nature and prone to um, or, or subject to real movement by administrative agencies. Ted, you alluded to the, the Microsoft antitrust case uh, from the end of the Clinton administration, beginning of the Bush administration. Just the other day, I was listening to an interview with Bill Gates from about a year ago at the Economic Club of Washington, where he blamed sort of that litigation for freezing Microsoft in its place and ultimately falling behind on mobile. Um, he, he drew a direct line from Microsoft losing out on mobile to the, the uncertainty that was imposed on the company um, by the, the litigation. I just, I'm curious, um, you've been at Facebook and I, I didn't mention, but you've also were general counsel at, at, uh, at AOL, uh, general counsel for AOL in Europe, right? Europe, um, yeah. And so you've worked, you've been in, in, in high levels in two large companies that deal with that sort of regulatory and antitrust risk. And I'm just curious, do you look at the Google and Facebook lawsuits that are pending right now and, and see any risk that just the uncertainty of litigation might freeze them in, in a sort of a competitive disadvantage while other uh, parts of, 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 of the economy are kind of growing up around them and maybe competitors could pass them by on some things? I think that's definitely a risk, Adam. And um, well, I would say at the outset, Microsoft seems to have recovered pretty well. Right? Yeah, they're doing all right. <laughs> I'm doing all right. Um, so Microsoft, you know, 20 years down the road is doing just fine, I think. I think, you know, Google, Facebook would love to see themselves and have that kind of endurance, you know, if we're sitting here in 2040 and talking about, you know, companies that are as successful as Microsoft remains. But certainly it, it did it did hinder Microsoft. I think there's no question it did um, set them back for a few years and they've recovered very nicely. But I think it, it did... Um, you know, it's, it's disruptive internally. It makes you probably much more risk averse. It gets lawyers way too involved in business decision-making. Um, so I think all of those things are an issue. Of course, that's also what you would expect uh, Microsoft to say, and you'll hear the same thing from Google and, and Facebook and in, in its, um, it, as they, at least certainly in the you know, in, in their general communication about these cases, they'll say, oh, you're going to set us behind, you're going to set behind American innovation. And again, I think there's a lot of truth to that. At the same time, you know, there's you know, the, for massive companies like Facebook, Google, Microsoft, they are, of course, much better able to deal with those you know, regulatory complexities than our smaller companies. And that's something to keep in mind as we think about, you know, Either executive branch, you know, Biden administration regulation of the companies or new legislation, um, you know, you may find Facebook and Google encouraging not a breakup. You don't want that, and not the undoing of an Instagram or WhatsApp. But you might you might find those companies welcoming 
regulation because they've got the massive legal teams and policy teams who can deal with that, whereas startups don't have that and you know, don't want to be spending their venture capital money on hiring lawyers. And Adam, is it okay if I, if I jump in here just because I've, I've done research on this exact topic and it's kind of a, a bugaboo of mine when I hear Bill Gates say things like this. I think um, one, we just keep in mind it's like a self-serving narrative for Gates and the other Microsoft executives at the time that instead of saying, hey, we just got beat and we didn't make a good enough product relative to the iPhone or uh, to Android, um, it's, it's actually that's the government's fault. And I think it's really telling either it was in that interview or another one around that time when, when Bill Gates was talking about this narrative, the, the interviewer asked him like, oh, so, you know, because there's also this narrative that the IBM case was similar. And it was, that was a that was more than a 10 year case, it'll be a 13 year case. Um, during the case, IBM unbundled hardware and software. Some people like Professor Tim Wu at Columbia argued that though the government didn't win the IBM antitrust case, the pressure, they think calls it the policeman at the elbow effect, um, forced them to kind of unbundle hardware and software, launch the software market. And if you think tech is software, then like that created the tech market essentially. Um, and so the interviewer asked Bill Gates like, oh, is that what happened in the IBM case? And he says, actually, no, 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 I don't think that was antitrust. That was a classic Clay Christensen innovator's dilemma thing of IBM was a mainframe company trying to get into the PC market. They didn't understand what they were doing. We, the Microsoft guys were smarter and we did, and we wrote the contracts in a way that were beneficial to us and not beneficial to, to IBM based on how we thought the industry would evolve. And so I would just, I, I would contend that the same thing is true in the Microsoft case. And my, my main data point here being, when, uh, Microsoft launched Windows Mobile in the year 2000. The iPhone came out in 2007. So it's a much smaller market in the early to mid 2000s for smartphones, but w Windows had a majority market share, greater than majority market share. And the key thing in that case, again, it's an innovator's dilemma problem was Microsoft was trying to port the desktop experience to mobile. So it felt like Windows on a desktop, it was sold, it was, they thought it would only be used by business people, it wouldn't be a consumer product. And then Apple came in with a blank slate and said, we're not gonna port Mac onto the phone. We're gonna create a whole new thing. It'll be for consumers. We can charge more money for a premium experience. And they really just kind of reset the whole model. And so I think, again, it's a classic like innovator's dilemma issue that Gates himself might not recognize. That's a great point. I, I'm going to turn back to antitrust in just a minute, but before I do, uh, you know, Ted was able to go last and was able to sort of react to things that were said earlier. Uh, Alec, Lily, do you have anything you want to add based on anything, anything else that you heard? Maybe we'll start with Lily. Uh, sure. Yeah. One thing I wanted to address is I, um, I think I'm in the minority here, but I really do think we will see some action on some of these issues. And I think Ted's point that there are some pro um, tech folks in the administration like Ron and Jeff, I would, I would question that assertion because I think there are others like Bruce Reed, um, who is deputy chief of staff to Ron, who, you know, helped craft the California landmark privacy law, has spoken out against Section 230, um, that will be extremely tough on tech. And I think there are others, you know, CFPB leadership hasn't been confirmed, but Rohit Chopra coming um, from the FTC is not going to be easy on tech. And I think when it comes to FinTech and CFPB's role in those issues, we will see, um, you know, tougher action there. And I think, you know, there are, there are a number of roles yet to be filled that the Biden administration has not um, prioritize in the same way it has prioritized COVID and economic appointees. But I think, you know, at, at the FTC, at the FCC, um, we are yet to see them fill out a lot of big roles that will play a big role in how tech is tackled in this administration. And I think, um, I, I, I think based on everything the Biden campaign, you know, stood behind during the election, we will see, um, you know, folks coming in with a harder angle, looking at these issues um, pretty critically. Um, and I, I think for that reason and the political will and sort of the interest um, across the country on these issues, I, I think we will see action. I'll just kind of jump in there. And I think I'm glad Lily brought up Section 230. So I think that's a, that's a key issue where at a high level, we might see reason for action on this because you hear you know, President Trump tweeted many times when he, when he was president, repeal section 230, all caps, like, let's do it. You hear senators like Senator Cruz, Senator Hawley criticizing section 230. They mischaracterize it as a subsidy for tech when it's not a tech specific, law. it's not a big tech specific law. It protects all companies, small and large that host third party content. Um, and then you have Democrats, obviously during the campaign, uh, then candidate Biden said that he would be in favor of repealing section 230. 
And so you'd say, hey, like this is bipartisan agreement. Maybe this is a, one of those rare issues that could get through a divided Congress or a narrow majority Democratic Congress. But when you drill down to the details, I, I see compromise hard on this issue because both sides want exact opposite outcomes. So conservatives want less moderation, more hands off. They want the companies, they want, they want Twitter to leave, leave Trump alone. They want them to stop deplatforming people. And liberals and Democrats, they want to see more moderation. They think there's too much harmful content on these platforms. They want to incentivize the companies to be more aggressive in moderation. And so it's hard for me to imagine um, a legislative package that um, you know, satisfies both parties when they want opposite things. And to kind of put concrete, make that more concrete, is that every single Section 230 reform bill that I've seen in the last few years, because I, I see, I, I think there are problems. I think that this is not a perfect system currently. But then whenever I hear an, uh, an individual package, I look at the details and I'm like, this would make things worse. Like, I don't, I don't think any of this is like actually going to make the world a better place. Um, so it's a, it's, a really, it's a really hard law to reform in a productive way without um, doing more harm than good. And I'm going to just, this is more like a hot take that I have not published on or fully committed to yet. But I think we need to be more creative and look at other areas. Like I, before I would have said, let's leave libel laws alone. That's something Trump talks about wanting to loosen up the libel laws. But if we have to look at the last three months, what's the one successful case of, of something actually um, limiting misinformation and, and limiting lies? And it's the voting machine companies suing media companies and individual hosts for spreading lies about the stolen election and voter fraud. And that's where like, if you loosened up libel laws, those lawsuits might happen more. Those companies, like people are being fired for spreading misinformation. The companies themselves are very scared of losing multi-billion dollar lawsuits. Um, I proposed, I floated this idea on Twitter. Some of my friends in the UK said, be careful what you wish for. So I get, I get there are trade-offs, but um, I think that's just a really telling example of like, what's the one thing that has held people accountable in the last few months with all the lies that are going around and it's, it's the voting machine companies suing for libel. So actually maybe instead of going right to antitrust, let's stick with this, this issue of the information, misinformation, disinformation debates. Um, I mean, it's right that conservatives and liberals uh, Republicans and Democrats alike, they all seem to be agitating for some sorts of reforms. Ultimately, they might wind up in different directions in terms of the, the bottom line of the policy substance. But could there be just agreement on a framework for reform, right? I mean, one thing that I wonder is if, if Josh Hawley and, and Elizabeth Warren agree that there needs to be reform, but can't agree on what it should actually look like in the end, they might agree on a regulatory framework, either empowering the FTC or other agencies or creating some new agency. And then just hoping that in the long run, uh, future administrations will steer the actual substance of policy in a direction that they like. I mean, is there any possibility that, that there might just be energy focused on creating a, I can't remember what it's called, a digital regulatory authority, I think I've heard some calls for that, that becomes sort of an empty vessel um, for substantive policy, but gives both sort of conservatives and progressives who are clamoring for reform sort of a, a way to, to, to both move the ball forward. I'm, I'm not saying I, I like that approach. I'd have real worries about it myself, to be quite honest. But I, I wonder if maybe that that's just the natural equilibrium with this kind of bipartisanship we have on this particular issue. Um, Ted? Uh, Adam, interesting idea. Um, you know, I do agree strongly with Alec on the the reason for the, un, the the low likelihood of Section 230 reform happening. And this is what I was alluding to in my my opening remarks of, you know, I think a few months, I'd say this, you know, the tech sector is, you know, neither party likes big tech now, to put it mildly, right? So, so it, I think there was a possibility a few months ago that you might have your Republicans who are extremely frustrated with, with big tech for reasons that go back many years and, and for perceived bias and um, both on you know who the companies are supporting with political donations and then also how from a you know Republican conservative standpoint how they're skewing the debate right and, and, and squelching debate on one side you get that anger combined with as Alex said you know the, the democratic anger going the other way that hey you're not you're not suppressing enough speech. You're not you're not censoring enough bad stuff out there. You're letting you know so-called misinformation uh, stay up there, and you're too big. You know, so you might you might have gotten some strange combination of that, that then pushed toward a, a bill that didn't really make a lot of sense. It was it's, it, it would be incoherent. You know, to Alex's point, you sort of 
you have both sides arguing for the exact opposite, you have the sides arguing for the exact opposite thing, but somehow there seemed to be a sense maybe last summer that, you know what, both would combine behind something and, you know, I don't, you know, you'd get a curtailing of section 230 immunity for no good reason, right? For for kind of in you know incoherent, but you want to take a shot at big tech because both both parties are angry at Silicon Valley. I think that's less likely now. I, I do think the you know the deplatforming, you know the post January six stuff, has really you know entrenched conservatives on that side of saying, well, listen, you know you you know, you can't you 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 know, we're, we're we are even angrier than usual at at tech, but what we want is for some sort of common carrier regime, right? We want to treat you guys like common carriers, right? Where you have to carry everything. And that's, you know, that is even more clearly the opposite of what a lot on the democratic side wants in terms of the, you know, the, the regulate, increased regulation of speech. Um, that's just on 230s, so a strong agreement there with Alec as to the, why that's even more unlikely now. Um, uh, on, you know, it, could there be momentum for a, you know, new regulatory body that regulates everything tech or maybe granting of additional powers to FTC? Maybe, um, I just think it's, I think you'd run into the same issue, you'd run into the same problem of the, the real source of the frustration of, you know, both parties being very frustrated with big tech, frustrated with Silicon Valley, but for very different reasons. So I think both would fear, hey, if we kick this over to an independent agency, then that's going to swing wildly between administration changes and neither one's going to be happy. Um, so I, I think that's unlikely, but who knows? Lily, Alec, anything else you want to throw in on that? Go ahead, Alec. No, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just add real quick. I agree with the last thing that, that Ted said in terms of, I think, I think you would see a real revitalization of the more free market right, uh, libertarian right come out and against an idea like that. And they would, because in the same way that um, Democrats during during the Trump administration, I think often picked up the baton of libertarian favorite argument, which is like, what if the, your worst enemy ever had total power in the executive? Like then what powers would you want the executive to be vested with? Um, and so there was a moment, a, a brief moment of clarity, I think on the democratic side, where it was like, Ooh, maybe there are some risks to more um, executive power here. And I think that that argument would come back very strongly from the right um, if any kind of um, uh, industry tech industry regulator were proposed, because they would say, so you're going to kick this, you're going to add more powers to a Democratic uh, FTC uh, with you know, a 3-2 Democratic majority, and how are they going to regulate speech? And so it'd be a much um, uh, higher hill to climb, I think, in the, in the current circumstances. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, I, I guess I just, I echo the, um, I think there is, it, it is, we have not been able to come to any solution or consensus on this thus far, despite growing concerns and growing understanding that, you know, more than 90% of Americans are consuming their media online from a lot of these tech platforms. Um, misinformation is spreading, it's a problem. Um, but I think certainly, I mean, we have to recognize that with this is still very divided Congress. I mean, any sort of legislative action is going to be extremely tough to get over the line. But I think, I think there's an opportunity um, to hold companies more liable, whether it's through a separate regulatory agency or as Ed said, giving the FTC further authorities. Um, I, I think the biggest problem that continues to be a question for platforms is where is the red line on a lot of um, content moderation questions. Um, and there seems to be, you know, the issue is who decides the red line and what do you do about it when a content passes the red line? Um, and I, I think, of course, there is concern with um, government regulation, but I think in a situation where platforms thus far have not been able to figure this out on their own. I think it's also extremely clear that we can't leave this to platforms to figure out on their own. Facebook's oversight board wasn't enough. Actions Twitter has taken are not enough. I mean, they've just been too slow, not responsive and uneven um, in terms of their, even, you know, I, I think like 
blocking Trump on Twitter after he got out of office, of course, that was um, a politically influenced decision. I mean, when he was in office, he wasn't blocked. And so I, I think there we have yet to come to any um, smart or strategic um, solution on this. But I, I think that probably the Biden administration starting with establishing some sort of commission or um, office that is dedicated to tackling this across agencies and thinking what regulatory levers there are um, within existing agencies and whether there's a need to launch a new um, regulatory body or agency is would be useful. I should uh, add on what, what Lulie said there. I think it just sparked an idea in terms of Here's a more optimistic take of how problems might get solved without legislative action. So I agree with Lulia. A big question is like where companies are drawing the line these days. And I also agree with her that uh, the companies are acting very opportunistically uh, and strategically with changing policy, changing personnel, going from a Republican to a Democratic administration. So you're going to see a lot more former Democratic Hill staffers and Democratic administration people being promoted to senior levels of decision-making at these, these tech companies, and you're gonna see them being more aggressive and taking down content. Trump being the foremost example, but there are lots of other examples of, of taking down QAnon groups and other groups that Democrats are very upset about um, and, and allege that they're spreading misinformation. And so here's the optimistic scenario. The optimistic scenario is like, because, because tech companies fear Democrats the most for the next four years, they become much more aggressive in content moderation. And that actually seeds new platforms. So that was like starting to happen with Parler um, and then obviously they got shut down and might come back, but you have things like Telegram and Signal, like encrypted um, other you know, smaller apps that are growing very rapidly. And so you can get a situation where because of increased um, content moderation and deplatforming from the major platforms, you actually get more competition in the market. And so you get rising third um, spaces and um, smaller players. And so you get more competition, more outlets for people to say more objectionable content that the mainstream platforms wouldn't, and you get a better ecosystem. And then maybe in four years, no one will be happy, but there'll be less of an impetus to like actually, you know, change the laws. Well, I have to admit that's my own sort of thought of where this might end up is something similar to that, that with the, especially with these two antitrust suits now pending, right? The Trump administration filed them, but now they're the Biden administration's lawsuits effectively. And so they can become a, they can become lawsuits about something different than they originally intended to be. Um, what I mean is the Biden administration now has a lot of leverage to sort of nudge, we'll say, uh, the, these companies and maybe others towards adopting codes of conduct for themselves, um, in effect, sort of taking a preemptive effort to self-regulate. Um, as Ted says, some of the bigger companies might like that, right? They might like to set the rules on their own terms, ones that they're already sort of well-equipped to satisfy. And so you might see the pressure for a, a regulatory environment get channeled through the antitrust suits into voluntary or voluntary-ish self-regulatory codes of conduct that, um, that, would, that would move policy in a direction uh, that the Biden administration would like without actually having to regulate. I mean, am I being sort of paranoid there or is that, is that, is that a, a, a likely scenario? I think that's quite possible, it's Ted, and you know, I, I think that's that's quite possible, and it would be you know implicit, and right? no one would make it explicit. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you know, I think there's this there's a natural, you know, there'd be a natural desire on the part of, of big tech companies to, you know, again, natural and appropriate desire to be well liked and understood by the executive branch, and and. So to, to engage substantially with the Biden administration um, and all the more so when you have these you know, significant um, significant lawsuits pending against you. Uh, but I could certainly see that. Can I make one, one point on this as well? Um, just taking that in a slightly different direction. I know we're talking about federal government, executive branch, Biden administration, but I do think that the next couple of years, the next four years, um, could will be a. I think there's a real opportunity here for the states that have been trying to position themselves as tech innovators, right? And I'll talk about Texas, Florida, and Arizona, right? Arizona with Doug Ducey. But you can, you know, getting back to what I started with, which is a lot of these issues are are outside the federal government. They're they're state issues, um, and you have 
three governors in those cases and some mayors, you know, Austin and you know Suarez in Miami, who are very aggressively promoted themselves as a, a, a refuge for Californians, right? A um, you know, come to us, you know, leave California, come down here where the water is literally warmer than it is here in the Bay Area. Um, and you know, you could see this being an opening. So if, if there's going to be sort of a freeze or lack of movement at the federal level, except on some of the things we talked about, we can go back to. And then and a generally increased regulatory environment on those issues at the federal level, then it makes a place like California, you know, California and the federal government are much more in lockstep than they have been the past four years, of course, on tech policy as in, as in many other policies. And that, will I think, underscore the differences between a very deregulatory and pro-tech environment like Doug Ducey has always tried to set up in, in Arizona and that Texas and Governor Abbott um, have set up, and again, Miami with DeSantis, DeSantis and Suarez. So I could see this really, you know, it's not a federal issue, but you can see this enhancing and, 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 and accelerating that exodus from Silicon Valley to those three states in particular, based on regulatory moves by those states. Um, and you could also see things, I could see efforts by, by those governors in particular and those legislatures to adopt requirements you know, to the 230 issue. You know, I could see states saying, listen, if you wanna do business in Texas, right, you have to commit to you know, not deplatform people, right? You have to commit to carry all voices. You, you know, we'll treat you as a common carrier for speech reasons, right? And that'll, you know, the companies might say we're okay with that. They might not, but you know, you'd see a lot of a, a lot of aggressive moves by those states in response to a an increased regulatory posture in the executive branch. I think that's a really interesting idea that, that Ted brings up, and I want to build on that a little bit, maybe um, add some complexity to it. So I think I think I agree with his his view of how governors of those three red states are operating and mayors in a lot of these cities and often mayors are blue, but in those uh, cities I believe they're, they're led by Republicans. Um, but I think those leaders are being undermined by some of their uh, other officials in their own states. And so, um, for example, in Texas, you have Attorney General Kim Paxton who joined, was one of the leaders of the cases to challenge election results um, in, other, in other states for that Coral College. Um, he's a leader on a separate um, antitrust case against Google. Um, and so he's really kind of waving the flag of like, big tech is a problem. And maybe that's not too scary for startups, but you know, every ambitious startup wants to be the next big tech company. So maybe if Kim Paxson isn't coming after you today, like it still probably worries you um, what they're trying to do there. And then I believe it's in the state legislatures in Florida and maybe elsewhere that they're considering these bills that are section 230 or speech related. And I would say that that's maybe a net negative for companies looking to relocate their services there because at the end of the day, what is common carrier? Common carrier is a government taking or government obligation saying you have to open up your platform to anyone on a, on a common basis on a um, fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory basis. And I think a key thing we've learned if anything from um, user generated content and open social media platforms the last few decades, it's like, that's just not gonna fly. You're gonna turn into 4chan, you're gonna get overrun with with Nazis and pornography and all sorts of just terrible content, you have to moderate. And so um, I think it would be not as appealing to companies as, as we might think that like, if the, if the states themselves actually take take action on, on common carrier rules. Uh, I just have a few more questions of my own. So I'll just remind the audience, if anybody wants to submit a question for our guests, just put it into the Q&A function and I'll, I'll read it. Um, thinking about the way that regulation is implemented, let's assume that legislation is a long shot. And so we, we are focused on what an administration or the other the independent agencies can do on their own. There's lots of ways that agencies can make policy, right? They can make rules, they can issue guidance that's uh, nominally less binding, right? It can be just sort of dashed off very quickly. And even short of guidance, uh, heads of agencies give speeches and they sort of indicate the direction of policy. Um, I've heard arguments both ways on what's the, the best policymaking approach for, for, for fast changing uh, tech industries, right? On the one hand, uh, rules uh, that go through a long notice and comment process, um, they offer a greater certainty, right? Because they're harder to change, but of course they're harder to change and so they can quickly become outdated. So some would argue better to work with guidance, stock through guidance and sort of be nimble. 
On the other hand, that really undermines policy stability. The companies are looking at policy that could change on a dime and it's hard to make long-term plans. Do any of you have suggestions on, on which approach is better? I mean, either across the board or for particular policies that we've talked about, the gig economy, antitrust, any of these things? What's the, is it better for agencies to go slowly through notice and comment rules that stick or should they move on the fly with guidance documents that, that can keep up with industry but might create some uncertainty? Alec, maybe we'll go with you first. Yeah, um, and, and I'll, I'll kind of preface my comments here by saying I'm, I'm at my training is as an economist, not a lawyer. So I might be a little out of my depth here, but I'll, I'll give it a shot on this question, which, which is that I tend to have a bias towards soft law mechanisms, some more of the guidance approach, just because technology changes so quickly. I don't know if you can wait around for definitely, it's hard, really hard for legislation and maybe even still too hard to wait around for formal rulemaking. Um, and so what I like to see is I like to see definitely see guidance on these issues to kind of reduce some uncertainty for companies. And then a key thing would be bring a lot of cases. Like, I think one, this is why we definitely support more resources for the FTC and DOJ is because I think part of the dissatisfaction with the current environment is that people think that the rules need to be changed. When I, when I would argue that it's, a, it's really an enforcement intensity on the margin issue, especially in other sectors that we don't have time to talk about today, but healthcare, agriculture, I think there are lots of antitrust problems there that if the agencies had more resources and had the right officials in place, they would bring those cases. Um, but this is also on consumer protection on privacy issues. The more cases you bring, you create um, a common law within the administrative agency. And so companies can look to like the previous 10 cases and say, okay, the guidance was a little unclear. Maybe there's some uncertainty, but based on the outcomes of these previous 10 cases, I know where kind of the line is. And so I'd like to see them build up the common law of, of the FTC. Luli, you know the power of the pulpit. You used to be a deputy press secretary for a, a prominent senator. Um, do you have any thoughts on this, on the, uh, any advice you give for agencies on, on how much to try to achieve just through um, through the words they use rather than sort of formal policies? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think um, I can be more conservative on sort of my thoughts on, I think executive action should be used um, strategically, but sparingly. I think executive action that changes every four years is not useful. Um, and so anything that we, any change, even if it takes longer to achieve through um, legislation will be more useful in the long term. I think we have a just deficit of uh, legislation, any sort of um, thinking from Congress on tech very broadly. There's no committee that is, you know, specifically focused on tech issues. Judiciary handles a lot. It's all split amongst a number of um, committees and a lot of members to date have not been laser focused on, you know, tech. And I, I think that deficit in Congress has sort of um, been part of the factor why these issues have sort of been ignored for a long time and haven't been, um, you know, top of mind as definitely members in the House come in for two years and then are running for re-election as soon as they um, get in and their constituents are mo more focused on the economy, health, traditional priority issues. Um, so I, I think, but I, I think as so, sort of there is more political will and interest to act on these issues, there's an opportunity for Congress to um, make change slowly. Um, but I, I agree with, you know, I echo a lot of what Alex said. I, I think there is some opportunities for the Biden administration to build out guidance to um, through, you know, evaluating more cases, sort of coming to a coming closer to a common law for dealing with some of these issues. And I, I think that will be useful um, in this administration. But I, I think the goal should be um, regulatory action through Congress. Ted, you've seen it from both sides. You've not only been a general counsel, but you've, you were deputy staff secretary in the White House. You've seen how the sausage is made, at least for executive orders. I mean, wh where do you land on this issue of, of the regulatory vehicles that, that, that might be used to govern uh, this, this part of our economy? Yeah, Adam, you know, having seen it on both sides, and this is uh, you know, going exactly where I was thinking on this, it really depends on whose side of the table you're on or which side of the table you're on. From the administration standpoint, I would say, Guidance followed by a, a, a rulemaking is the way to go. That way you get your guidance out quickly. You get your interpretive letter out. 
um, that put that, that sets your policy out there and most companies are going to abide by that um, and, and just assume that's the way you're going to bring enforcement actions and the way you're going to you know, handle these issues. And then you follow that with a full notice and comment rulemaking with the final rule that goes into effect. And that way you can make it harder for your successors to change that rule if they're so inclined, right? From a company's perspective, I'd say it just, I think guidance is, you know, it, it really depends on, on what the rule does. A, you know, guidance or interpretive letter that is deregulatory is generally going to be great, right? A final rule that's deregulatory, relatively speaking, is great, right? You know, Uber, Lyft welcomed, of course, the, um, you know, the Department of Labor's most recent rule, right? Um, and now that it's, you know, that's helpful to them now, you know, and they would have, you know, they would love it if that were a final rule that had taken effect. I'm quite confident they would, they would prefer that. Um, so deregulatory rules are great, whether it's guidance or, or a final rulemaking, probably better if it's a final rulemaking. Um, and if it's a, if it's a, if it's guidance that instead imposes greater restrictions or hurts your business in some way, you don't like that, right? You know, for example, the 2015 guidance from labor about gig economy workers. Um, and again, I just underscore here as well, um, you know, for, for larger tech companies, you can deal with the whipsawing, right? You, in, unless your business model is entirely dependent on some regulatory interpretation, but you can deal with the whipsawing. If you're a you know, larger fintech company or you've got greater resources, um, you can deal with, you know, either changes between administrations or 47 different rules from 47 different states, applying for money transmitter licenses in all these different states. That's something you can do that's much harder for a small company. So it's a question of size and which way the rule goes. Let's, let's stay on this theme for just a, a moment longer because um, Lily raises this, this issue of regulatory uncertainty and just changes from one administration to the next. I mean, I haven't been in practice for a few years now and so I've, I've forgotten how that all works, but it seems to me that if, if a, a regulatory regime is changing significantly from one administration to the next, then the decision makers um, at the companies, they probably start to take a longer view, right? Trying to figure out what the policy equilibrium is in the long run. Um, and if they can have reason, reasonable confidence of where they think that's gonna wind up, regardless of who's in power in a given moment, they'll probably start to plan in that direction. I mean, Ted, is that a, a is that, Am I sensing that correctly? And, and if so, I'm curious if people think that there's any of the issues we've talked about um, that might just sort of naturally gravitate in a certain direction just for the sake of, of policy stability in the long run. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right, Adam. I mean, if, if you have, if, you, if you're fortunate enough as a company to be of scale and have that size and those resources to, um, you know, stay abreast of potential changes, um, think about privacy, right? I mean, I think it's so much easier for a company like Facebook or Google to say, well, hey, listen, you know, Brussels is kicking around these proposed changes, you know, um, wow, hey, this case and this is case in France about right to be forgotten. And, you know, let's figure out what that'll mean if that goes, if that goes the way we don't like as the company and, um, and you can anticipate that. And then, at the you know, at the appropriate time, raise the management team. Hey, these cases could could cause the following. These cases, these potential raises, could cause the following changes to our business plan. So let's do something that's a little more in the middle and allows us to adapt. Or hey, understand that we may have to hire an additional five thousand contract workers to go through posts if we're required to take more things down or or um, or. or, or grant more privacy protections we may we may just need to scale up the budget but that's a luxury the big companies have and and it is something that's why you have a policy team in addition to your legal team right to a understand uh understand proposed changes that are that might happen over the next couple of years and ideally if you if you're if you can do it to influence them and make them and shape them so that they don't hurt your business too badly just Believe one, it. yeah, just one quick follow up point. I think also, I mean, I think this is a big question of, you know, whether executive or congressional legislative action is more useful. I think it 
also very much depends on the issue we're speaking to. You know, I think on competition issues, antitrust, the FTC just has more purview to provide um, guidance that is actually uh, definitive and, you know, can make a difference on issues like privacy. We sort of, I, I, I think, you know, we're at a loss for in terms of what executive action could really achieve. And I think on issues like privacy, if you really want to see change, you need some sort of baseline privacy legislation. Um, so I, I think it very much depends on the issue, wh whether, you know, the Biden administration should sort of, should sort of turn um, and take lead and sort of um, driving forward some sort of executive action or whether um, they should turn to Congress um, to see what, what, um, what we can get bipartisan um, agreement on. Well, I mean, I think I would be remiss if we let a conversation about regulatory flip-flopping and tech policy go without mentioning the forbidden phrase of uh, net neutrality. And obviously that's been kicked back and forth um, between uh, the FTC and the FCC. And so obviously the Trump administration repealed net neutrality rules um, and that kicked it back to the FTC for, for the last four years. Um, and just to give you some perspective, my organization, PPI, we actually took a middle position, which was we were opposed to Title II classification at the FCC um, because we thought it was an outdated, it was, it's an almost centuries old rule that really is designed for um, utilities and not for not for the internet service providers. But we did endorse net neutrality legislation. And so we'd love to see um, le a legislative fix this. Again, I'm not predicting any success because the odds of any piece of legislation passing are low, but that would be a nice way to um, end the uncertainty on that issue. And I think it's also, it's also a particularly important issue for regulatory certainty because internet service providers make tens of billions of dollars in capital investments uh, every year and those have really long lead times right and so they would love to have more certainty about in 10 years well i have uh, rate regulation on what i can charge on this network and if i if it were set too low i wouldn't be profitable to make this investment now and maybe i'm hesitant to do so and so having certainty about the future path of regulation um, for internet service providers could actually have huge benefits and could kind of get most of the benefits of what people are worried about, which is content neutrality. And I think the ISPs will tell you they have no interest in censoring certain kinds of content. They don't want to be in that game. But under Title II classification at the FCC, they are worried about these more utility style price regulations um, that weren't, I think, in the, in the public's mind in terms of what they were actually worried about. It is sort of amazing to think that, I mean, just five years ago, when people talked about regulation and tech, I mean, net neutrality, if I remember correctly, really was the main thing we were talking about. And now today, just five years later, we can have a conversation about tech and we get to minute, you know, 72 before somebody brings up net neutrality. Um, this is my last question. Um, let's just assume away for the moment the, the, the question about whether legislation would pass on any subject. Um, but sticking with this theme what we're on, I'm curious if for, for each of you, is there one area of, of regulation, whether it's fintech, the gig economy, anything else we've discussed, where that, that would best benefit from legislative clarification to sort of set policy for the longer run? Um, I know Alec, you just touched on one. I don't know if you, on net neutrality, I don't know if you have another one in mind, but I'd be curious for everybody if there's if you could snap your fingers and and get legislation of any kind on one particular issue, which one do you think would benefit the most from an updated legislative framework? Yeah, I'll I'll definitely take the opportunity to to flog a paper and a legislative proposal that my colleague Michael Mandel and I uh, wrote last year, and we're working with some moderate members of the Democratic Party on, and it's related to gig worker benefits, and we think. A really underrated, and I agree with Ted's previous points that a lot of the action here is at the state level. But we think the reason, in addition to the classic reason of like you don't want 50 different state laws saying 50 different things about gig workers, independent contractors, employee benefits, et cetera. Um, in addition, we think one of the real problems here is the unfair tax treatment of benefits for gig workers relative to benefits for employees. What I mean by that is that most employee benefits are tax advantaged. And so employers have an incentive to offer more benefits in the form of retirement plans, health insurance, paid time off, et cetera, because th some of those things are tax advantage. And then uh, a gig company can't offer benefits to gig workers without classifying them versus employees. And so they're at a severe disadvantage and that's why um, the economic model is currently as it is. And so Michael Mandel and I put a proposal together that would be an opt-in regulatory framework. And so companies would opt in to um, participate in these plans, offering these plans to their employees it would be a cafeteria style plan. So workers can allocate the benefits how they want. If they want it for paid time off, if they want it for health insurance. Um, this is part of the problem with the California model of Prop 22, where they 
made mandatory health insurance contributions by the gig companies. And some, some gig workers already have health insurance. They're a family member or whatever. And so you want to really have flexibility in which benefits workers select. You want it to be um, aggregated across platforms so they're portable benefits. You want them to accrue with earnings proportionally as they work more, they get more benefits. Um, and, the key, and then they get that tax treatment. And then the key thing for the companies would be um, simplifying the test of who's a gig worker and who's an employee. And so a benefit for the companies is we want to simplify that test. And it's if you have control over the hours of when the employee works, we think that's basically all you really need to prevent a democratic concern, which is that, you know, will Walmart, will Starbucks dump all their employees into this new regulatory model and make them all gig workers instead of instead of full-time employees with benefits? And our point is you can't run a Starbucks, you can't run a Walmart retail store by offering employees to show up whenever they want. And you're going to do surge pricing on how much you pay them. It just, it's, it's unworkable. And so, so long as you have a simple test like that, you can get the tax advantage problem fixed. And I think we could be a model to get gig workers benefits they need urgently um, uh, and solve it at the federal level once and for all. Anybody else want to wave the, the legislative wand? I think for me, it would be um, a baseline privacy law, I think. And I, I think the COVID-19 pandemic sort of has heightened, heightened the urgency for it. Um, you know, we are literally doing everything online. Um, and I think the amount of consumer data that companies across the board have um, has just grown and grown um, over the past decade. Um, and I, I think we, at this point, um, it's time for a baseline privacy law that puts um, restrictions on every single digital company. Ted? I would um, you know, join with Alec. You know, Alec, I haven't read your paper, so I can't endorse that, but, but certainly clarity on gig economy, um, gig economy worker classification, I think would be extremely, extremely valuable. Um, uh, so many tech companies, you know, and, and again, what is a tech company? What do we mean by that? But so many tech companies adopt that model. And, you know, it, the uncertainty is not helpful. Again, the big companies, big gig economy companies who have broken through that and achieved scale already, they can deal with it either way. Um, but I think it's a, it's a form of work that's highly popular in America. Um, and, you know, I think there ought to be some way to solve the benefits issue that Alec mentions, you know, making benefits more portable. And, and um, you know, that seems to be what's really driving the, the whole debate over it. So I think if you resolve that in, in, a, in a way that achieves appropriate compromise, um, you're going to see that, you know, these gig economy jobs flourish even more. Um, I would also say, you know, this is not going to happen, of course, but again, you said this is the magic wand time, but if there could be some resolution of the Section 230 issue and that stops deplatforming. I do think that's going to, I think the deplatforming um, trend in Silicon Valley companies and the, you know, those the sort of, you know, gen, you know predominantly one sided censorship is going to be, you know, I think long term, very bad for America, very bad for the state of our political discourse. Uh, and if you know, I'm not endorsing common carrier, across the board, but some sort of common carriage principles or resurrection of, of true First Amendment doctrine. Again, these are private companies. First Amendment traditionally will not apply there. You know, pause on, you know, Ju Justice Alito's comment in the, you know, Packingham case about, about, you know, social media being the town square today and what special burdens that might put on these companies. But, you know, understanding is not, is generally not a First Amendment issue. But there can be some, some way where you say, look, short of, you know, true incitement or encouragement of violence. You know, you're not going to let. You don't want Hamas to have free reign on, on your on your platform. And you don't want it to become totally overrun with with the worst of humanity. But you know, certainly, you know, from the conservative perspective, the the pendulum has swung way too far the other way, and you're getting you're taking down speech that you know the First Amendment would strongly protect and certainly protect against government uh, censorship. Um, so some sort of resolution there that, that uh, I, again, I don't see it happening. I think the parties are too far apart on what the core problem is. As Alex said, they see the problem as exactly the opposite of what the other party sees it as. Uh, but I think some resolution there is important for, uh, for the political health of America. 
Well, I think we'll end it here. Thank you so much to Alec, Luli, and Ted all for joining us today. A special thanks to Luli who joined us at the, at the, at, at the, the 11th hour after we had an unfortunate uh, scheduling glitch uh, with, with one of our speakers. But I'm so grateful for everybody who could tune in either live or who's going to be listening to this in the podcast. And just a couple quick announcements before we go. Again, this is part of a series of uh, webinars that we're having around the inauguration in the first 100 days. Before the inauguration, we had webinars on White House regulatory oversight and OIRA and on energy and environmental policy. Uh, now we have today was tech and coming up next on February 25th, we'll have a webinar on, on possible policy changes on civil rights and law enforcement. And then we'll finish up with financial regulation in early March. Uh, keep an eye on the Gray Center's website for updates. We're always posting more working papers. Just in the last few days, we posted a series of working papers looking at the 75th anniversary of the Administrative Procedure Act, which is the summer that'll all be published in the George Mason Law Review later this year, but you can get a preview on our website. Again, please keep an eye out for the announcement of our next webinar on February 25th and the one after that. Thanks as always for joining us and we'll see you again soon.